And welcome to Lift FM 98.5, 103.3 FM, and 97.9 on your FM radio dial. And as always, we are worldwide at liftfm.com. Remember all of our programs here on Second Chances. We have so many people reach out to us uh, from email to phone calls to Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and say, how can I hear those programs again? I heard them when they were originally broadcast on the radio or on the Internet. Is there a place that you can hear those programs again? And the answer to that is yes, AdvantageRadioMinistries.org. That's www.AdvantageRadioMinistries.org. Click on Second Chances and then just find, uh, it, they're in alphabetic order by last name, the name of the guest you'd like to hear again, and you can hear their interview in its entirety at your convenience. And we have a guest with us tonight. Uh, he's a wonderful man. We've had a chance to visit with him for just a few minutes. He is the author of the book, Divine Love, Divine Intolerance, and his name is Daryl Ahrens. And uh, Daryl, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight on Second Chances. Thank you very much for having me, Greg. It says here on your uh, sketch about your history that, among other things, you're a former Marine, a Air Force fighter pilot, high school teacher, pastor, and you hold uh, degrees from Chapman University, Boston University, uh, the Fuller Theological Seminary, and uh, you also have a wife and two kids, five ga- grandchildren, and you live near Phoenix. So with all that in mind, you have been a very, very busy man over the years. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's been exciting in many ways, <laughs> now, but I've also wasted a lot of time, to my regret. <laughs> yeah. Now, Daryl, obviously, as I was sharing with you off-air, um, one of the things we really like to do to uh, just kind of lead us into our ultimate discussion, which will be uh, what the Lord's been doing with you currently with your book, is to find out, uh, you know, where you're from and a little bit about uh, the fact where you're raised in a Christian home and things like that, so we can kind of get to know who you are. Yes, I, was, uh, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, um, and I did, uh, was raised in a Christian home. My earliest recollections are going to Sunday school and, uh, and church there. Uh, and uh, well, since I was about seven years old, I, my goal uh, was to be a, a fighter pilot. Uh, as I grew up, also in my teen years, I became very, very um, serious about uh, my faith. Uh, and that so those those two uh, those two things were central in my life at the point at, at that point. Um, as I entered college, I was doing well in college, but after a year and a half, decided to do something exciting. Me and another guy, so we joined the Marines, <laughs> and uh, did a tour in the Marines. And then after that, I went back to college and got, uh, and then afterwards got a commission in the Air Force and an appointment to pilot training. I, did a military career, and uh, during that period of time also, for probably about 20 years, I sort of took a detour, you might say. Uh, I, my Christian faith was still was still in my heart. I, I still had that, but I must admit I probably wasn't living as a Christian in many ways. But after about 20 years of uh, detours, uh, my wife and, and uh, some other friends of mine uh, military officer friends, uh, um, due to their influence, I, uh, I got serious about my faith again. After my military career, I felt a strong leading to um, go into the pastorate, go to seminary. Um, at the time, I had two, uh, two uh, children in college, so I had to work. So I taught high school for about 11 years. Um, in the meantime, I, then I finished seminary and was called to, uh, called to pastor a church. So uh, right now I'm uh, pretty much fully retired, if anyone is ever fully retired. I'm very active in the church, of course, uh, sort of uh, uh, preach and preaching and teaching and, uh, and, uh, and uh, involved in many other activities of the church, which keeps me busy. Now, to writing. <laughs> mm-hmm. now, one of the things that you mentioned is uh, some of the regrets you had. Uh, was there some things that happened in your life that uh, are things you would, wouldn't mind sharing that were some of the things that uh, kind of led you off that uh, path of uh, really living for God? Well, yeah, I, I, uh, um, 
well, especially during my, you know, I was in the fighter pilot days. I was living the, you know, the the, uh, the, the, the fighter pilot life, which is usually cons- uh, considered as a, as a fighter pilot's life. And in many respects, there, uh, I, w- I was, you know, uh, living in, in in many ways contrary to God's God's will and and God's word. But that was always always in my heart. And uh, you know, once that seed is planted. It, uh, it never goes away. And and finally, after a period of time, after I say uh, coming under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I, uh, I uh, got serious about my faith, and uh, I thank God for that. Now, to put on the other hat as pastor, one of the things that you mentioned, which was uh, certainly something that uh, I feel uh, very strongly about, is uh, you mentioned one of the first things as a child growing up that you attended Sunday school regularly. Now, as a pastor and as a, as a, as a, you know, people, uh, some people go to church regularly. Some people, you know, hardly ever go to church. But little kids in particular, if their family does not attend church on a regular basis, if they do attend church once with a neighbor or a friend, And they go to Sunday school, that is usually the place where a lot of information sticks with them. They usually recall it. And in addition to that, if you uh, don't go to a, you know, Christian school, but you do go to Sunday school, that's the place you also learn a lot of uh, uh, Bible stories and things like that. So in your opinion, how important do you think Sunday school really is? That is crucial. It is absolutely crucial that children, when they are children, young children, be, be uh, uh, <clears throat> introduced to the faith. And, and some of my most wonderful memories are as a child in those Bible stories. Those Bible stories are so, so important uh, to a young child because that stays with them. The seed is planted and it stays with them, and the Holy Spirit works, works with that. I have a terrible burden and a terrible sadness over the fact that so many, many, many of our young children are not exposed to that, and they grow up not not knowing that. But that is absolutely crucial. I think uh, that was one of the one of the things uh, that really made an impression on me. Like I say, when I was taking a taking a detour or whatever, um, when he was when he was uh, uh, um, told to me that uh, one day as a parent we will be called to account for what we did with the children that God gave us. And I thank God that uh, 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 whoever told me that, and, and well, primarily it was my wife, but others too, I thank God that that really, really struck home with me. And, uh, and at that time, then, we, we did raise our children uh, in the church uh, with family devotions and all the rest of that. But that is so crucially important because we have so many young people out there today wandering around without values or 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 accepting false values uh, secular values uh, that uh, that don't know uh, the love of god for them and and uh, and and don't know their their, their savior or, uh, or or given any information about about him uh, that is absolutely absolutely crucial now you talked about uh, a lot of things that you did but in the you know, context of all the things you did to kind of summarize, never heard you mention that you were into writing. Is that something that's come along in, in more recent years, or is that a passion you've always had? Well, I've always kind of had a passion for writing, but as far as a book, uh, that came in recent years, just uh, a couple of years ago. And basically, uh, Greg, what caused that, I really got tired and sick of being told that if I don't... Uh, tolerate or uh, things that are contrary to God's word and contrary to the faith, contrary to uh, the values and vision of our founding fathers for our nation, and contrary to common sense, that if I don't condone and approve those, uh, then I'm a bigot or a homophobe or a radical or whatever. Uh, The title of my book, Divine Love, Divine Intolerance, I, I uh, um, uh, make the point that, that the tolerance today espoused and demanded by uh, 
secular progressivism and moral relativism and our radical liberals is an ungodly tolerance. It's an ungodly tolerance that uh, is contrary to biblical truth, historical fact, common sense, and is a tolerance that corrupts the individual and the nation. Uh, the, you know, God, I mean, point, God is not tolerant. God are not tolerant in the way that uh, liberalism today uh, defines tolerance. God is incredibly merciful, incredibly patient and compassionate and loving of the sinner, but God does not tolerate sin. And we see the perfect example, the perfect confluence of God's love and God's intolerance on the cross, where we see the Son of God, Jesus Christ, suffering, suffering unspeakable agony to pay the price for our sins, that's God's love, incredible love for the sinner. And we see his utter intolerance of our sin that made that sacrifice necessary. Um, so, yeah, I, I really got fed up with uh, today's, uh, or the liberals' definition of tolerance, uh, which they've taken that word and corrupted it, and has had a devastating effect on our church, on the church, on our nation, uh, on our institutions, our educational institutions and other institutions, and on our culture as a whole. And so I decided to do something about it. And so I wrote the book. Now, in the book, Divine Love and, and Divine Intolerance, first of, uh, first of all, tell us the story of, of actually how you got it from the point to, to write it, to get it published. Tell us about that process. Well, I sat down to write, but as I went on and researched it, uh, actually it turned out a whole lot you know, more extensive uh, than what I had planned originally. Uh, if you look at the table of contents, uh, um, what, I, what I did, uh, I drew parallels, uh, six, or parallels in six areas between Old Testament Israel, his, Israel's history, and what is happening in America today. Those parallels are in the areas of, first of all, purpose, and then uh, purpose and um, the moral law, government, religion and worship, education, and society. And I draw those parallels. What happened to Old Testament Israel in each of those areas, how they departed from God's covenant, how they became steeped in sin as corruption entered and grew and grew and wickedness did and what happened in each of those areas to Israel until finally God had to judge them because that was the only cure. And I state specifically in detail what is happening to America in each of those areas. And we are following in the footsteps of Old Testament Israel. And if we don't get our act together... Uh, soon we are going to uh, suffer a similar judgment. Now, you mentioned in the book about, uh, and this probably ties into really what you were just touching on, but you mentioned in the book that Western civilization is at a crossroads today. Can you go into that a little bit more for us? Yes. Western, civil Western civilization was built on the foundation of Judeo-Christianity. Western civilization can trace its roots back to the Reformation. I mean, this is historical fact. Western civilization, and I'm including the United States and our founders, um, it, was, it was established on the foundation of Judeo-Christianity. Well, we look what's happening today in Europe and in our country. Europe, especially, look, uh, when we look at that, Europe is, is pretty much pagan today. They've departed from that foundation, from their Christian roots, and what's happening in Europe? I mean, absolute disaster uh, in just about every every uh, every area. And the United States is following that same path. We're not as far along yet um, as they are, but we're getting there, and we better wake up and change directions very soon. So Western Christianity is at a crossroads. Does Western, do the Western nations remain faithful to their foundation, to their Christian roots, 
or do they go, uh, as they have to a great extent, uh, uh, do they uh, uh, depart from those roots and uh, establish purely secular uh, uh, societies? We're visiting with Daryl J. Ahrens. He is the author of Divine Love and Divine Intolerance. And, Daryl, one of the things that you mention uh, in your book is that you say is that God is not tolerant. So with that in mind, how do you balance his love along with his intolerance? Because his intolerance is the genuine form of love. The basic flaw in liberal philosophy today, and by the way, liberalism today is far different from the liberalism of the past. The liberalism of the past was in many ways noble and, uh, and righteous in that. The liberalism today is an ungodly uh, liberalism, and it uh, promotes and espouses an ungodly tolerance. Liberalism considers tolerance as a highest virtue and intolerance as the greatest sin. What they fail to realize, and what Scripture tells us, what historical fact tells us, what common sense tells us, is that often tolerance can be a harmful and a counterfeit love, whereas intolerance can be a genuine and ultimate love. And as I said before, we see this perfectly in the cross of Jesus Christ. And any parent should know that. Uh, <clears throat> often you have to be intolerant when uh, when your children are doing something or whatever that's uh, that's harmful to, to themselves. Uh, so that's the basic flaw in the radical liberalism of today, this whole thing about tolerance. Toler they give tolerance a far different meaning than what uh, than, than the original and the true meaning of it. Now, you talk about uh, the world being at odds with the truth. In what specific uh, ways would you say that the world is at odds with the truth? Yes, one of the chapters in my book is entitled The Truth of Truth. The world does not want to accept the fact that there is absolute truth. In fact, liberalism does not accept that fact. Because if absolute truth obviously is the truth of a transcendent authority, the truth of God, the truth of Holy Scripture. They don't want to accept that, because to accept that as absolute truth means you have to face some very hard decisions. And is, is what, as far as lifestyles, as far as uh, attitudes uh, go, you have to face some hard decisions. Uh, so they don't want to accept that, that there's absolute truth. Do you want to accept the thing, well, you have your truth, I have my truth, uh, uh, everyone has their own truth? Well, if there's no such thing as absolute truth, then truth loses all meaning. There's no such thing as, as truth then. It's all opinion. And my opinion is not necessarily truth. My opinion is my opinion. So, yes, there is such a thing as absolute truth, and that is the absolute truth of God's Word. In his, in his commands. You know, to most people that uh, you would go up to on the street that are not Christians, that, you know, they hear the word sin and realize what the uh, Christian's <laughs> concept of the word sin is. And, and to those people, the Christian concept of sin seems to be outdated. Now, why would you say that is? Because they went their own way. They don't want to. If, if you acknowledge sin as Scripture and besides, and, 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 and also... Man doesn't decide what sin is. God decides what sin is. God has made it very clear in his word. Well, people don't want to accept that because, again, that's going, to, that's going to be convicting to them. And they don't want to be convicted. I mean, they want, they, they, they want to be approved of. They want their, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a lifestyle or whatever it is that is contradictory to God's word, they want approval for that. They don't want to... Uh, uh, so that word sin is uh, anathema to them. I mean, you go in many churches today, you're not going to hear a sermon on sin. I mean, it's a very unpopular subject. You're in many churches, you're going to hear a, hear a um, um, wishy-washy, uh, uh, touchy-feely uh, sermon on, uh, you know, tolerance and all the rest of that. But sin... It's, it's, you, you know, you discount sin, and basically you discount the Bible, Scripture. I mean, 
sin is the reason that God sent his son into this world to solve the problem of sin, to pay the price for sin, to open the, the way for people to be cleansed of their sin and to be restored into right relationship with God. But for, for people who, who uh, want their own way and, uh, and all that, yes, sin is a very unpopular subject. The, the first road, the, the first step towards salvation, Greg, is recognition of our sin and recognition of the fact that we are helpless to pay the price for that sin. But God has, has paid that price for us. We're visiting with Daryl Ahrens. He's the author of the book, Divine Love, Divine Intolerance. Daryl, as, as we just go through life here, the last, uh, you know, it seems like every year we get more and more of these type things, but, you know, here it is in a nutshell. When politicians pass laws that contradict the, God's Word and His will, what should we as Christians, what, what should our response be to those actions? I uh, talk about that in my book. In fact, I have a chapter uh, headed to compromise or not to compromise. The way we handle that, Greg, is the way Peter and John handled it. When Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin, who was the ruling authority, the ruling authorities of the day, you might say the government, and they were ordered by the Sanhedrin to stop preaching in this name of Jesus. They were commanded to stop preaching in it. And what did Peter and John tell the Sanhedrin? They told them, we must obey God rather than men. God has given us government for the good of society. But when government starts passing laws that contradict God's word, that uh, uh, then our loyalty must be to God, just as Peter and John's were. When uh, when government passes laws that uh, that uh, contradict our faith, that contradict God's word, our first loyalty is to God. Another uh, question along the same. Uh same type situation you know our, our our system of government really is is based on compromise so how do we as christians balance political compromise and moral compromise our founding father spoke to this uh very very clearly in fact in fact my book is filled with quotations from scripture which speak to what's happening in america today and it's filled with quotations from our founding fathers and other great historical figures that speak to what is happening in America today, and also which gives us the road back to recovery and to reverse this decline. But for as far as compromise is going, our founding fathers made it very, very clear in the system they were setting up that, yes, compromise is necessary in many ways. In fact, most of the legislation, if not all of the legislation passed, it is usually the result of compromise, but they also made the fact, they also emphasized time and time and time again that there are things that you don't compromise on, and that is you do not compromise on principles, on morals, on virtues, and on standards uh, of the foundation of the Judeo-Christian foundation of the nation. I mean, read their, their you read their writings and their statements, and they emphasize this time and time and time again. So, yes, compromise in many ways is good, but in other ways it is evil. Don't compromise with evil. And history shows us, and Scripture tells us, and Jesus talked about it, to compromise a little bit with evil results in more evil, and results in more evil until evil just takes over. I mean, he made this uh, clear in his uh, parable about the yeast and the loaf. He introduced a little yeast, and what, before long, the whole loaf is leavened. And it's the same thing with evil and corruption in this world. You don't compromise with that. Um, so, yes, uh, there are things to compromise on, uh, but there are other things that, no, no, you do not compromise on. We're visiting with Daryl Ahrens, the author of the book, Divine Love, Divine Intolerance. And, and Daryl, a couple things we, we, into our last few minutes here, a couple things we want to make sure we talk about. Number one, 
if they're really enjoying hearing what we're talking about with this book, Divine Love, Divine Intolerance, and they say, boy, I'd like to learn more about uh, Daryl Aarons and the book. Is there a website? Is there a place they can obtain a copy, learn more about you, things like that? Yeah, they can get a copy of the book from uh, Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com or uh, um, go to any Christian bookstore and ask for it. Uh, um, the publisher is Elderberry Press, and there is a number they can call here to uh, get the book directly, if I can give that to you. Absolutely. Go ahead and pass it along. It's uh, uh, 1-541-459-6043. Five four one four five nine six zero four three. So there, there are a number of places where they can uh, where they can get it. Now I also see you have a website. Can they attain a copy of that from the website that you have? Yeah, the website and the book is advertised on there too. The, the website is uh, www. dot Curly's Corner. Curly C U R L Y S. No e in it, but Curly's Corner. dot com. Where'd that name come from, just out of curiosity? Curly was my fighter pilot's call sign. Ah, curlyscorner.com, without the E. <laughs> okay, Daryl, uh, one very important thing we, we want to certainly conclude with this, because this is the most important thing of the whole program, this is why we put this program on, is to give people that are lost, feel despair, and say, you know, there's got to be a light somewhere, and now I know that that light has got to be Jesus Christ, and I want to ask him into my heart. Would you lead us in prayer for anyone that's listening that would like to get set free and, and, and enjoy that, uh, that uh, divine life and divine love that they can only get from Jesus Christ? Would you sure. do that for us? Sure. Dear God, Heavenly Father, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would bring revival to this nation and bring revival to all of us. Dear God, you have given us the wisdom, the truth, and in your word, the divine truth, the, the absolute truth. And through that truth, O oh Lord, you give us discernment. And that is so lacking today. The, the ability, the, the, the wise ability to discern between right and wrong, good and evil, to discern between your will and this world's will. God, we need that wisdom. And that wisdom comes only from you. As your word tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, God, I pray that you work in people's hearts and that you work in our nation, in our nation's leaders, O oh God, to open their eyes to what's happening to our country, to open their eyes to your will for our country and the will expressed so clearly and by our founding fathers, that you would open their eyes and their hearts O oh Lord, to receive your word and your will, that we may go forward, O oh God, to fulfill your purpose for our nation. And our founders said that, that your hand, O oh God, was, in, was directly leading them in establishing this nation, and that your purpose was that our country could be an example to other nations, uh, an example of the freedom and the liberty that we have only in you. So, God, I pray that you reverse this this heresy and apostasy that is so that is so prevalent in your churches today and in our government in our schools and and uh, in our society that you would reverse that and open people's heart to the truth and God your word is truth and to open their hearts to your will and purpose for God your will and purpose for every individual and for nations for our nation is our highest good, because you are a gracious and a merciful God. So, Lord, we put our hope in you, we put our trust in you, knowing, O oh Lord, that you will lead us, lead us to the true success and fulfillment that you have for all of us. So we ask that in your name. We ask that in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our guest on Second Chances has been Daryl Ahrens, the author of the book Divine Love, Divine Intolerance. Once again, if you'd like to learn more about Daryl, his um, work, and uh, find out about obtaining a copy of the book, the well, probably the easiest way to get it all, www.curly, C-U-R-L-Y, without the E, S, as in Curly's, corner.com. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here at Lift FM 98.5, 103.3 FM.
and 97.9 on your FM dial, and of course, AdvantageRadioMinistries.org.